Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. I'm Michael Hanlon in the Foreign Policy Program, and I have the privilege of being up here today with two of my good friends who have written remarkable new books about Afghanistan, Max Boot and Steve Young. And, uh, uh, excuse, me, uh, uh, excuse me, about Vietnam. Uh, that's the Freudian slip that Those tells might you be where. Two other good friends. Yeah, two other good friends, right. But I got the names right of these two. Uh, and this is Steve Young, not the quarterback, and this is Max Boot, yes, the Council on Foreign Relations scholar. And uh, Max also and I. Also not the quarterback. Right, also not the quarterback. Well, maybe. Not with the high school team, right? <laughs> or the Redskins, because we haven't finished that conversation yet as to um, this team's future. Uh, I luckily had some of uh, their material to read over the weekend rather than abusing myself with that, watching that football game. Uh, but um, we are here to be treated today to some very important new histories about Vietnam. And we will get into, potentially, Afghanistan later with your help if you wish. But that's not where we're going to start. We're going to start by burrowing in a bit on Vietnam and the books these two gentlemen have written. Of course, Vietnam is still uh, an important part of our country, and it's not just its history, but its contemporary outlook on life. As Faulkner said, the past is never forgotten. It's not even past. And I think that's certainly true with Vietnam today. A lot of, a lot of you, a lot of us, have been influenced by Vietnam directly and personally, but also it clearly influences our national politics and our ways of thinking about war and social cohesion and a lot of the issues that are back on the agenda today. But again, we're not going to start there. We are going to start by talking about the specific books and histories they've each written, which take angles on Vietnam, but speak more generally to that war. Uh, Max wrote a book called The Road Not Taken, and it's about a man named Edward Lansdale, who many of you are familiar with, and who Max is going to talk more about in just a moment, uh, who had some ideas on Vietnam that clearly were not ultimately at the core of American policy, and a big question is how much difference would it have made if they had been more heated? And that's certainly going to be the theme we continue on with Steve Young as he talks about his book on the Chords Program. And by the way, the Chords Program is interesting enough and important enough that some people, including Steve, think the war could have gone much differently if we had full-heartedly and more early on endorsed it. But it's also a little bit opaque enough and forgotten enough that many websites can't even agree on what the initials stand for. I think everybody says civil operations, but after that, the consensus seems to diverge as to whether this was revolutionary development or rural support or a little of both. The first one sounds a little, a little lefty, uh, but it may have been the accurate name, at least for a time. Steve can explain all of that to us shortly. But this was an idea to try to really work on both local, and local security and good governance at the local level, the kind of themes that we've continually been debating and discussing in regard to Iraq and Afghanistan in this century. So our format today will ultimately get to you and we'll want to involve you and your questions in roughly the second half of the 90 minutes. At the beginning, what I'm going to do uh, in just a moment here is ask first Steve and then Max just to mention a little bit more about the specific scope of their book very briefly so you can begin to see how we're envisioning the flow of the conversation. And then I want to take 10 or 12 minutes with each of them just to ask them to explain some of the big ideas in their book, the main flow of their argument, the main flow of their history, with a couple of follow-up questions from me. And I'll begin with Max, because Edward Lansdale sort of comes first in the Vietnam history. Uh, he had been involved in Vietnam in the early to mid-1960s especially, and Max will say more about that in a second. The Chords debate may have had some roots in earlier periods in the Vietnam campaign, such as it was, but it really became a, a big idea, an official program, more towards the latter part of the 60s and into the 70s. And I think it's fair to say, although Steve can quickly correct me here in a second when I give him the podium, that there is a serious argument as to whether if we had gotten to Chords sooner, as someone like an Edward Lansdale's outlook might have advised, whether we could have done much better in Vietnam. So that's the question before the jury, and also whether there are any lessons for today in our current counterinsurgency and stabilization missions uh, in the United States at the moment. But that's my once over. Let me ask both Steve and Max now to situate, in their own words, their book uh, in this broader debate, and then we'll go into the actual meat of the discussion. Steve, uh, oh, one more word. Steve has a distinguished career um, in, in uh, philanthropy, in corporate good governance, in, in social responsibility, a con considerable background with Harvard University, both its uh, college and law school, and then later as an assistant dean. Uh, a lot of uh, ongoing activities in the great state of Minnesota as well. 
Um, and so we're very glad to welcome him back to Brookings. Max went to Berkeley for college, uh, then studied history at Yale in graduate school, and as you know, is the author of previous award-winning books on in counterinsurgency, on, um, on revolutions in military affairs uh, and related matters, and just one of the most distinguished authors and national security uh, scholars of his day. So without further ado, Steve, please tell us a little more about your book. Thank you, thank you um, Michael. So. Uh, there's a long story behind this book, uh, which I will avoid talking to you, but it began when Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker, who was our ambassador in Saigon from 67 to 73, asked me to help him write memoirs. So I worked with Ellsworth, and he passed away. The memoirs did not get published. I had a lot of stuff I, from his files, from the interviews, from reading all his secret cables. A lot of it was about uh, the pacification, working with the Vietnamese on the political side. Um, I'd also served in courts myself. And so I tried to pull together a story about, about cords, um, which nobody was interested in, frankly. So the years went on, and Iraq happened, and Afghanistan happened. And I had a friend a couple of years ago who said, Steve, the people have to know about cords and, and its successes. That will be one of my points. But um, I said, I've tried. Nobody's interested. So well, you've got to make it academic. <laughs> you've got you to have a theory. Because people don't want to rethink Vietnam very much. Uh, this is all before the Ken Burns program. So he said, well, why don't you do something with hard and soft power? So I said, OK. So then I tried to think about how does Cords, counterinsurgency, if you will, because there are a lot of harmonies between this and, and Ed Lansdale. How does, and so I want to reference Ed Lansdale. So how does an Ed Lansdale approach fit with hard and soft power? So my first response was, yes, it's soft power. And the more I thought about it, I said, no, no. In fact, the more I thought about it after that, and I know Joe Nye, soft power is, I will be very frank, ladies and gentlemen, on many points, it's a stupid idea. <laughs> but we have, we have dichotomized our thinking about power and foreign affairs into two in, incompatible alternatives. Um, I take a, I'll go into this later. There's the continuum, I argue, it comes from Clausewitz. Most of what goes on is in the middle. Neither hard power nor soft power is relevant. Something else is relevant in the continuation of the spectrum from, if you will, from peace to thermonuclear war. Cords is in the middle. So I try to articulate a theory, and I put a clumsy name on it, called associative power. Because the genius of cords, and this goes back to Lansdale in 54 and 55, is you work with other people. If you want to be successful, it's not unilateral. So Cords ultimately is combining efforts, US, South Vietnamese, US, military and civilian, South Vietnamese, military and civilian. It's all about putting together a complex joint venture. So that's my point number one. My point number two is that basically defeated the Viet Cong and we won the war in South Vietnam by 1972. So you can see this is going to be provocative. Thank you. That was excellent for situating the topic within the broader subject. Max, if we could ask you to do the same, and then I'll launch in with a little more extensive discussion of your book. Well, my book is a biography of Ed Lansdale, but really seeks to tell the story of our involvement in Vietnam through the life of Ed Lansdale, who was this once legendary covert operative said to be the model for the ugly American uh, as well as for the quiet American. And he was uh, somebody who had a career in the Air Force, ultimately retired as an Air Force two-star, but his most illustrious years were spent on assignment to the CIA. In the early 1950s, he masterminded the defeat of the Hook Rebellion, the communist insurgency in the Philippines, and his uh, reward for that was to get a one-way ticket to Saigon in the summer of 1954, where he helped to create this new state of South Vietnam and became very close to No Dinh Diem, the first leader of, of South Vietnam. He subsequently left uh, Vietnam and became engaged in other pursuits in this town, uh, including running something called Operation Mongoose in 1962 to overthrow Castro. Uh, but he kept close tabs on what was happening in Vietnam, and he was very dismayed by the course of events, in particular by the rift between the Kennedy administration and ZM. And he watched uh, helplessly from the sidelines as the Kennedy administration did exactly what he told them not to do, which was to overthrow ZM, which he warned would be a disaster because it would undermine whatever tenuous stability South Vietnam had achieved in the early 60s. His advice was disregarded. 
He was forced forcibly retired by Robert McNamara, with whom he clashed incessantly. And then he went back for another tour of duty in Vietnam from 65 to 68, working first for Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge and then for Ellsworth Bunker. And again, his advice was largely ignored because his advice was really to focus on creating a viable political entity in South Vietnam, one that could win the battle for hearts and minds, that could compete with the Viet Cong in the attempt to govern the South Vietnamese countryside. And of course, the, the, the main uh, thrust of U.S. policy was simply to bomb North Vietnam and the Viet Cong into oblivion because General William Westmoreland thought that he could defeat the enemy by killing a lot of them. And Lansdale argued consistently that was not going to work. In fact, it was going to backfire. He was really a pioneer of what we would today call population-centric counterinsurgency, the idea that to be successful, the troops have to win the confidence and support of the people, and you don't win the confidence and support of the people by destroying their villages and killing them. And a lot of that went on in, in Vietnam, obviously, under both the French and, and, our, and our war. And so he argued against all that, and he was largely disregarded. And he retired in, in the middle of 1968 after the Tet Offensive, disillusioned and dejected, uh, because he had seen his advice consistently uh, ignored by the powers that be. And so the reason my book is called The Road Not Taken, Edward Lands, the only American tragedy in Vietnam, is because I suggest that there was another road that Ed Lansdale had argued for. Uh, and we could have, if not necessarily won the war, at least things would have been, would have gone at lower cost, both to ourselves and to the Vietnamese, if we had followed the approach that Lansdale advocated. Outstanding. Uh let me ask a little more about that approach because, you, and I guess I will at least mention in passing already Iraq and Afghanistan, you and I have had the privilege of seeing some ama amazing Americans in action in the wars of this century where when I reflect on the comparisons of Iraq and Afghanistan to Vietnam, I don't get the sense that, that Vietnam was all that well poised to win. And I'm gonna have the similar kind of question for you, Steve, a little later. And so, you know, you can try to do a, a combined effort, security and good governance and economic development, but in these societies where institutions and individuals are weak or corrupt, uh, where there's an outside power with sanctuary and support from abroad, it seems like it's a daunting proposition. So I just wanted to ask which of the tenets of Lansdale's do you think were sort of well enough and sophisticated enough in their, in their development that they really could have made a, a ma meaningful difference. Is it primarily just taking away the bad stuff we did? Or do you really have a sense that Lansdale had a complex integrated concept in mind that itself was refined enough that it really could have worked? You see what I'm getting at. In other words, the, the barrages with artillery, with napalm, uh, the harm done by those seems so great that maybe simply avoiding that would have been the benefit of listening to Lansdale? Or do you think that he had really worked through a, a combined concept that it, you know, that sort of added up to something particularly synergistic? Well, I think a lot of what Lansdale was preaching, again, is what is known today as population-centric counterinsurgency. I mean, he really invented, uh, you know, the modern-day counterinsurgency in the late 50s, early 60s, helped to give the Army Special Forces their counterinsurgency mission. Back then, it was called counter-guerrilla warfare. Eventually, it became known as as counterinsurgency, but the basic insight of that is to position the, the army on the side of the people to avoid heavy firepower, but also to focus on governance. And that's something that we still have a lot of trouble with today. I think the, you know, Mike, you and I were both in Iraq uh, during the surge, and I think, you know, part of what made the surge in Iraq successful in 2007, 2008 was basically the application of Lansdaleism to Iraq, although it certainly wasn't viewed that way, but you know the, the counterinsurgency manual tried to distill the lessons of past counterinsurgency, and Lansdale wasn't cited, but certainly others who had very similar viewpoints were, and so I think that was what enabled at least some of the temporary success, but it wasn't more lasting in, in part because I think that even now we neglect uh, the basic emphasis that Lansdale put on building governmental institutions and working closely with local political leaders. And I think one of the, you know, big mistakes that we made in both Afghanistan and Iraq was, was becoming so at odds with our local allies, with, with Maliki uh, and uh, with, with Hamid Karzai. Uh, and in some ways this paralleled our falling out with No Din Ziam, which had such catastrophic consequences in, in Vietnam and led to the Americanization of the war.
and I think you know part of Lansdale's genius is that he was, along with T. E. Lawrence, one of the most illustrious advisors of the 20th century, and he was somebody in the Philippines. He became as close as brothers with Ramon Magsaysay, uh, who was the defense minister and whom he elevated essentially to the presidency in the Philippines. And he again became very close with ZM in a way that no other American was as close with them. And he was. You know, he really established a rapport, and he was able to get them to do what he wanted, not by hectoring them, not by lecturing them, not by giving, you know, uh, non-negotiable demands, which tends to be the American way of dealing with, with, with weak local allies. But he would befriend them, he would listen to them, and he would sit there for hours. And in the case of ZM, this was quite an ordeal because anybody who dealt with them could could tell you that he would go on for hours, and most Americans were ready to strangle themselves. Uh, you know, listening to the minutiae of South Vietnamese politics, but Lansdowne had this infinite patience, and he would gladly listen to what ZM had to say, no matter how long-winded he was. And then eventually, he would kind of lean into him and say, "So, if I understand you, what you're saying is X, Y, and Z." And then he would subtly rephrase what he had just heard and, and gently steer this foreign leader along the path he wanted to go, not by telling him, God damn it, this is the way we're going to do it. We're Americans and we know better, but by saying, you have the wisdom. I'm just helping to draw the wisdom out of you. It's a very different approach, much more effective, and it's something we, we fail to do with leaders like uh, Karzai and, and, and Maliki, and I think that's something that we still struggle with today. And I think, but that's you know, that along with limiting the firepower, it's kind of a general different approach to counterinsurgency. And it's, it's, it's worlds removed from the drone strikes, it's, it's military operations, because Lansdale was really focused on the political element of warfare. And, you know, we all know the Clausewitz said that, you know, uh, about, talked about the primacy of politics and warfare. But, if, you know, all of our military folks learn that in, in school, but we don't actually practice it on the battlefield. And we tend to, you know, give pride of place to combat arms, and we neglect the, the political dimension, which is why it's so hard to win lasting victories in places like Afghanistan, or Iraq, or today in Syria. So thank you. And, and you know, I'm just going to keep out with a couple more questions for you and then move on to Steve. And I realize we're just sort of getting little snapshots of your argument and your history. So I apologize if this is an imperfect way to do it. And we encourage everyone, of course, to read the book and buy the book. But I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the M and Lansdale. And you alluded to Maliki and Karzai. You could argue that with Maliki and Karzai, we stuck with them. And with Diem, we didn't. And in all three cases, we got bad outcomes, um, or, or at least in Iraq and Afghanistan, for the amount of effort we put in, the uh, results are pretty mediocre. And if, if those two hadn't been ultimately displaced, we were perhaps headed for an unfortunate outcome. One could argue that. So I guess I, 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 guess I want to probe a little more on the Diem question. I don't know the history of that individual very well, but what I do know isn't that impressive. And you didn't say anything just now that made me feel more impressed by DM. And I wonder how well we could have done with a guy who was widely seen as corrupt, as divisive, I think, between Catholics and Buddhists, um, as insufficiently attuned to where his people were at that moment in their history. Uh, is this really a guy that, even if we had displayed the infinite patience of Job or Lansdale that we could have brought to run his country well enough to defeat the insurgency that was being presented and supported from abroad by some pretty powerful actors. Well, I mean, what you're articulating is basically the critique that, uh, that took root in the Kennedy administration in 1963 and that led to ZM's overthrow. Uh, and it's a critique which is still widely held today, including if you watched episode two of the, of the Ken Burns documentary series, a lot of criticisms in there of of, of ZM. I, I wouldn't say so much for corruption, because I don't think even his worst critics accused him of being corrupt, but certainly he was accused of being autocratic, aloof, this Catholic Mandarin out of touch with his people, a dictator, and, and a lot of those criticisms had some validity. But here's the thing, you know, everybody in 1963 was so focused on how terrible ZM supposedly was, and certainly Halberstam and Sheehan and the press corps was, was howling for him, and uh, ultimately, the Kennedy administration concluded that we could not be successful in, 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 in the Vietnam conflict with ZM. But guess what? We saw what happened when he was actually overthrown, and the situation spiraled out of control because it turns out, in, in retrospect, that ZM was actually holding South Vietnam together, more or less. And as soon as he was overthrown, you had one illegitimate ruler after another, one military coup after another. Uh, and the security situation disintegrated, at leaving Johnson with no choice, he thought, but to send American troops if he was to prevent the collapse of South Vietnam. And I think from Lansdale's perspective, what he would have said is that, uh, you know, uh, ZM was underrated, that he was actually an honest guy. He had, he had 
credibility because he was both anti-communist and anti-French, uh, that he was really the most credible nationalist leader that South Vietnam could have had, but he had a lot of issues, and of course chief among them was his conspiratorial brother, No Dinh Nu, who pushed him to create a more fascist type state in South Vietnam after Lansdale left at the end of 1956. But what Lansdale consistently argued was, instead of raging against CM and, and, and giving the military the approval to overthrow him, what we need to do is we need to influence him for the better. And Lansdale, when he had been in South Vietnam, had actually managed to influence uh, ZM for the better, but after he left, we wound up with this adversarial posture with ZM where we weren't influencing, just like we wound up with an adversarial posture with Karzai and Maliki, and it, was, it, it wound up being incredibly counterproductive. So I, two more questions, one on military reform and the, and the performance of South Korean military forces, and then one on- South Vietnamese. Uh, South Vietnamese, thank you. And, and, but yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. One on thinking about, um, on, the, on the military reform piece, but then also one on thinking about local governance and what the Lansdale view of the world might have meant for South Vietnamese local governance and how you would have actually implemented this concept of population-centric security within Vietnam, given its various fissures and social challenges. So that's the second question. The first one, you mentioned Neil Sheehan, uh, Bright Shining Lai, uh, perhaps um, one of the best Vietnam books, and, and he, he did something similar in his book to what you've done, I think, in yours, to find one very interesting, important American who spanned much of the effort. And of course, that was uh, John Paul Van, if I'm getting that name right after my previous missteps. And, um, but I remember very vividly from the Bright Shining Lie book, a, a battle of, I think, Op Bok in 1964, where South Vietnamese forces performed abysmally. It was 63. Uh, 63? 63. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the performance was so poor that I have to ask, uh, you know, that's just one snapshot, and I'm just, this is a provocation, obviously, not, a f not trying to counter you. I'm just trying to set up a, a point of view and see how you would respond. Even if we had continued to massage DM and get him to make a few okay decisions at the level of national governance, weren't the South Vietnamese forces so unmotivated and incompetent, frankly, that they were up against a better foe? And the timeline on which the Lansdale effort would have had to occur would have been so belated compared to, you know, the, the kind of time we really had available to us that we would have been in a bad place regardless. I think that's a, a uh, I don't think that's a fully accurate argument, I guess I would say, uh, because there was certainly no question that the ARVIN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, had their weaknesses and they were up against a superb foe. Uh, in the North Vietnamese military machine and in, in the Viet Cong, some of the best soldiers in the world, no question about it. But in fact, and we can see this more clearly with the advantage of historical hindsight, uh, despite uh, the occasional reverses that they suffered and, you know, the, the Battle of Outback, which was one where uh, John Paul Van was the advisor to the, I think it was the Arvin 7th Division, and, and he, he castigated them in the press and, and, and gave the Arvin a bad, a bad name because of that. I think that was, in, in that period, in the, in the 62, 63 area, when ZM was still in power, was a little bit of an aberration because, in fact, at that point, the Arvin was on the offensive and uh, the Viet Cong were actually on the defensive. Uh, and they were dr being driven back not only by the Arvin, which had new American military equipment, American advisors, and was actually on the, on the go, but also by the Strategic Hamlets program, which was kind of a classic counterinsurgency initiative to try to secure the rural population from the Viet Cong, and again, that had some problems, and it was overhyped by, by the ZM regime, and uh, it, it expanded too rapidly and so forth, but generally, it was actually making headway, and if you actually read uh, the official history put forward by the North Vietnamese military and the North Vietnamese government, they will concede that they were suffering some serious defeats in the 62-63 period, uh, and it was there, they only really regained the, the initiative as soon as ZM was overthrown, because at that point, the strategic hamlets were abandoned, chaos gripped, uh, South Vietnam, all the, all the province and district chiefs were replaced. You had one military regime after another, so you lost any kind of cohesiveness or stability, and that's what really enabled this massive North Vietnamese invasion to occur, which led to, to Johnson's fateful decision to send American combat troops in 1965, which had Lansdale opposed. So, you know, I think, I hope that people will read my book with an open mind, because I think I try to provide a more balanced picture of ZM, and I don't neglect his, his dark side or his weaknesses, and there were many, but I, I don't think that he was 
uh, quite as bad a guy as, as has often been portrayed, and not as bad as the Kennedy administration thought he was, because in fact, as we know, things got a lot worse once he was gone. And then finally, uh, thank you. Uh, appreciate very much the you know, clarification on the key themes of your book and how they push back against some widely held views, including perhaps by me. Uh, but on the issue of the strategic hamlets and the, the potential for local political governance uh, to improve, what's your feel about, I mean, I think it's implied in your slightly more optimistic sense of how things could have gone, but, but how would the fishers in society uh, you know, the agrarian versus rural, landholder versus non-landholder, Catholic versus Buddhist. How could these have been, uh, you know, reconciled in a, in a strategy for good governance locally? Would you have had to uh, go for those towns and villages that were primarily, uh, you know, less divided, that were, that start with those, have the ink spots grow to the more complex areas of social dissent and uh, you know, divisiveness, or what was the potential really to bring this society together and unify it, uh, hamlet by hamlet? Well, that was actually a lot of what Lansdale was advocating, is starting with, with local areas that were more resistant to communism, where you had villages that were Catholic or, or belonged to one of the religious sects, the Cal Dai or the Wahau, uh, who were ideologically resistant to this atheist uh, uh, ideology and kind of expand outward, but he also believed it was incredibly important to have local governance in the villages. And one of the things that he thought ZM really made a big mistake on, which he did after Lansdale left Vietnam, was to end the local election of village chiefs because, and then start appointing them basically from Saigon, like the district and, and provincial leaders. And uh, you know what that meant in practice was that if villagers were not happy with their local chief, there was no way to vote him out of office. The only way to get rid of him was to dime him out to the Viet Cong and have the Viet Cong kill him, and, and that happened quite a bit. And the Viet Cong would tend to kill either the most corrupt and unpopular village chiefs or the most effective ones who are the, the best at resisting the, the, the communist offensive. But Lansdale thought this was, a, this was just a, a fatal miscalculation on ZM's part, and, and he probably would have been able to dissuade ZM from doing it if he had been around. But because he thought it was important for villagers to, to have confidence in their officials and be able to replace them through lawful elected means. And, and you know, Lansdale basically, I mean, his, he, he was certainly well aware of the fissures in, in South Vietnamese society, some of which you have, you have mentioned. But, I mean, he consistently argued that whether it was ZM or, or, or his successors, that they had to reach out to their political opponents to try to have a more inclusive regime that would represent all aspects of society and that would not rule in, in dictatorial or heavy-handed fashion. Uh, and he had some success in achieving that kind of outcome in the mid-50s when he had the full support of the Eisenhower administration, the Dulles brothers in particular, behind him. But in subsequent years, uh, he lost that support. And you know Johnson and, and Westmoreland and the folks who were running the war in the mid-60s just couldn't have cared less. They were happy to back a military regime and to you know go out and kill VC, and they kind of ignored you know, Lansdale's efforts to, uh, to increase governmental legitimacy by holding, you know, legitimate and fair elections. I mean, he actually managed to hold, you know, uh, uh, legislative elections in 1966 that were pretty fair, but he had very little support from anybody. And when, you know, uh, there was a, there's a scene in my book where Richard Nixon, who was at that point out of office, uh, but knew Lansdale from having served as vice president, came to uh, to Vietnam and visited with Lansdale and his team, and he said, you know, hey, Ed, so what are you guys up to these days? And, and uh, Lansdale said, well, you know, Mr. Vice President, we're trying to hold these, these, these uh, legitimate and fair elections uh, for, uh, the, for the legislature in, in, in Saigon. And, and, you know, Nixon kind of looked blankly, and, and his reply was, well, of course, I'm all in favor of free and fair elections as long as the right candidate wins. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that wasn't at all the, the Lansdale philosophy. His idea was you really ought to have real free and fair elections where whoever is the most popular candidate wins. But, you know, Johnson and Nixon and all these other U.S. leaders, their view was basically, well, we've spent years fixing elections in the United States, so why shouldn't we fix the election in, in South Vietnam? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, excellent overview. Got me very intrigued. And uh, it's just two weeks till Christmas, so I'll be doing some shopping that I hadn't necessarily, in, in the kind of quantities that I hadn't necessarily anticipated, because I think I'm going to send this book around to a few places. Steve, over to you. Um, let me, there's a lot on the table already. 
and you may want to comment already on some of what you've heard. But specifically, I also hope that you'll tell us a little more about the key precepts of chords. And the, the one question I would put before you is when I heard you talk about that continuum and you said that chords was neither hard power nor soft power, I actually thought it was both hard power and soft power. So maybe you can explain um, or help me understand my confusion. But you know, if you can lay out just a few more of the big ideas in the chords program and anything you want to do by way of reacting to Max as well. Okay, first point, reacting to what you guys have been saying, I, I will put before the group the proposition that chords addressed and largely solved all those issues. But sub rosa, one of my stories is I can't, I'm gonna, um, can't remember some of the details. I think it was 71. There were provincial elections. Parker, you may remember, provincial council elections. And I'm sorry, folks, it was either Peter Osnos or Peter Jay from the, from the Washington Post. I was working in Saigon at the time. I got to know him. The big thing about, you know, is democracy in Vietnam. I said, hey, there are these provincial council elections. And there are real competition going on down there. You want to come with me? So I think it was Peter Jay. So we went down to Vinlong, and I, where I used to work, and we went to a couple of districts, and there's these heated electoral going. Vietnamese do not get along with each other very well as a general principle. So there are a bunch of candidates. And he goes, he goes back to Saigon, and he says, Steve, I gotta thank you, it's amazing. He wrote up something like, I don't know, 30, 38 paragraphs on these elections. Story gets published in the Washington Post. And it was either, and I can't remember, ladies and gentlemen, it was either eight paragraphs on page 11, or 11 paragraphs on page eight, right? In other words, a major, major accomplishment in terms of what we Americans were trying to do in Vietnam, ignored, right? So the fact that I could say Cords addressed all these things, and some of you may be looking at me saying, you know, what's Steve smoking? Um, I can understand. Let me do two things. First, getting back to um, a Mike's point about the continuum in the center. I would argue, and this is, a, this is a debate I think we Americans and you here in Washington, you have to have. Both soft power and hard power are fundamentally unilateral. And I submit that if you listen to what Max was saying about Lansdale, because uh, my dad had the same experience with Zem in the 50s. Um, if you can sit there as an American and listen to somebody like that, you're not being unilateral. You're doing something else. You're building a relationship. You're building trust. You're doing something. So soft power unilateralism, quoting Joe Nye, uh, uh, Joe Biden just had a piece the other month. Soft power is they do what we want because they love our values. <coughs> right? Just like those Iraqis in 2003, right? Once we got rid of Saddam, they were all going to welcome Western democracy and American values and things like this. And I believe George W. Bush, our then president, later complained that nobody told him that there were Sunnis and Shia. <laughs> right? So soft power is they're going to do stuff for us. Karzai is going to get along with us. Mal Maliki is going to do what we want because our values, right? That's very unilateral, I submit. We lecture. The other thing with hard power is it's expressly unilateral. This is what Clausewitz writes about, right? I, I break your will through the use of violence. Now, what's in the middle? When I'm not there to impose unilaterally, I've got to work out a deal, a quick, a quick uh, uh, jaunt to history. Uh, Washington? George Washington won the Battle of Yorktown? Is that historically accurate? That he alone and the American forces won the Battle of Yorktown? Some of you may remember that Benjamin Franklin had negotiated a treaty of alliance with the King of France. And at the time of the Battle of Yorktown, what was out in the Chesapeake Bay? De Grasse's fleet, preventing the British from resupplying and, and uh, uh, supporting Cornwallis's troops. Without that French fleet, the British would have resupplied Cornwallis, Cornwallis would have won the battle, and there would be no United States of America. We only survived, we only won at Yorktown because there was an alliance. We were working with other people. They were helping us, first point. Second point, let me give you a, try to be very fast on what happened to create courts. And why was it created? Because I think it indirectly addresses these, the failures of these two extremes and something in the middle. Some of you may recall in the fall of 1966, we Americans in Washington, and President Johnson in particular, was faced with, with two competing philosophies about what to do in Vietnam. There was the approach of Robert McNamara and the military, which was hard power, roughly speaking. There was the approach of the anti-war movement and the Doves and George Ball and others, which was to negotiate. 
which was in effect a soft power approach. We, ha we have to negotiate and get out of the war. In October 1966, some of you may remember, McNamara submitted to Johnson what is fairly well known, and the text is in at least the Gravel edition of the Pentagon Papers, his memorandum, which basically said, um, I have come to the conclusion that nothing we are doing will defend South Vietnam. We cannot convince the North Vietnamese to give up. And I don't know what to do. I'm overstating the case, right? The memo is elegant. It is professorial. It is, it is emotionally neutral. It is well written. It is well crafted. The prose is excellent. But the bottom line is, so put yourself in the shoes of LBJ in October 1966 with congressional elections coming up in like two weeks, right? And, you're, and we're not talking about any Secretary of the State, ladies, uh, Secretary of Defense, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about Robert McNamara, iconic figure, and a very, very, very close confidant of Bobby Kennedy, who's telling Bobby everything he's also telling LBJ. And he's basically going to his president, who's got, listening to McNamara and the military, he's got 175,000 Masomanus Americans in combat in South Vietnam and more on the way. He hasn't given the military all they wanted. He's basically done the non-Lansdale approach. Just, I, I support what Max was saying. Now his Secretary of Defense comes in and says, oh, sorry, Mr. President, you can't win doing what I told you to do, and I don't have any ideas. In ending up my book, I was, um, a friend of mine suggested I go back to the LBJ Library in Austin, go through files of Comer, and I also said, oh, Walt Rostow, whom some of you may remember. I'll go through, because Ro Rostow was the... Uh, advisor for national security at that, be taken over from McGeorge Bundy. So I go through Rostow's files and Comer's files. Sitting in a folder in Rostow's files, which I don't think anybody sees, is a piece of paper with handwritten notes by Rostow of a luncheon meeting with LBJ on Massomanus, November 13th. I think I reference it in the book, uh, 1966. And the note says, um, put together a small group. You, Robert Comer, Chair Katzenbach, Cy Vance, and get a smart general, and rethink Vietnam. Now, I found no, I've never seen any other reference, I've seen nothing else that that group was actually formed and met. But with, by the end of November, within two or three weeks, Robert Comer on the White House staff comes up with a strategy for Vietnam, which is new and comprehensive, and it's in the middle. It's not more hard power. And it's not soft power. It's basically working with the South Vietnamese at the village level. It's kind of, it's a Lansdale kind of strategy. And mobilizing more and more South Vietnamese assets, i.e. the Arvin, i.e. the economic wealth of South Vietnam, got to get the economy going. And implicitly, in Comer's recommendation of late 66, phasing out and withdrawing American forces. This gets accepted by Johnson. In March, he, he puts it into operation by sending out uh, Ellsworth Bunker to be ambassador, Robert Comer to set up the Cords organization, and Creighton Abrams to be a deputy to Westmoreland to focus in on the Arvin and building up the capability of the Arvin. And those three people work on that for the next three or four years. And, there, and basically, as I said earlier, and I will defend it in the Q&A, the communists, the Viet Cong, the southern sympathizers of Hanoi were defeated and in 72, the Arvin held off a main force invasion of Hanoi's divisions with the help of American air power. But American bombing at Anh Lac, Con Tum, and, and um, Quang Tri would not have won the day if the Arvin had broke. And at least the Ken Burns film admitted that, that the Arvin stood their ground. And it was the Arvin under General Truong who recaptured Quang Tri. So what was Kors? I mean, uh, Next question. I mean, there's a, I, the book, I try to go through sort of year by year, step by step. How did this work? Who did what? What was the theory? And the basic theory, the operational theory, there were two phases, I argue. Uh, one, the first phase was sort of the Comer phase, which was of the, called revolutionary development, which was basically central government cadres coming down to villages to motivate the people. The second phase, which I give all credit to William Colby, who in my, in my experience that I worked for, the guy was a genius. I mean, he was just a remarkable man. Um, it was local elections and organizing the people in their local communities, which, Michael, gets to your point. If you're in a Wahau village, the Wahau elect their own village council, right? If you're in a Wahau Catholic village, depending on the way the election, you're gonna, you have a village council of 10 people, you're going to get six Wahau and four Catholics. 
And guess what generally happens among human beings in those kind of situations? You kind of work out a compromise. Right? The Wahau don't sort of step on all the Catholics. The Catholics get along a little bit, but then they ask for a few things. And in the ebb and flow of democratic politics, you, you, you trade off and you, you build a community process, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let me stop there. Fantastic. Um, if I could just add one thing please. to what Steve just said, because I, I obviously agree with what, what Steve is saying, but I think you know, the tragedy of Vietnam is that you know, we tried this other approach, the firepower-intensive Westmoreland Johnson approach, for, you know, really from 65 to 68, uh, with two years of, of complete chaos bef before that, between 63 and 65. And so by the time the alternative chords approach started to have some success after the failure of the Tet Offensive in early 1968, the, the patience of the American public was exhausted. And nobody at that point was, was interested in a fair assessment of what was going on in Vietnam. They just wanted to get the hell out. And, and essentially that unsuccessful approach that Johnson and Westmoreland pursued, which killed so many Americans and so many Vietnamese and also killed American popular support for the war so that, you know, by the time we started to get things more right, it was, it was too late because even, even, even Nixon was, and Kissinger were intent on, on just pulling everybody out as quickly as possible. So question for you, Steve, to follow up. You mentioned McGeorge Bundy, who I think left in 1966. And I think he left largely in frustration at how the, war, uh, how the war was going. He doesn't seem to have had, despite his great gifts, doesn't seem to have had the intuitive uh, realization that, that there was an alternative, right? Because he was a smart guy and a, and a pretty, uh, you know, historically minded guy. And if he had thought it was worth fighting for, that there was something else to do that was doable, presumably he might have stayed on. I'm just asking this as a provocation. So why do you think McGeorge Bundy didn't grasp the potential here out of the Lansdale model, out of, you know, in some ways, what seems like common sense, try to scale back the firepower, focus more on local governance. Why were we so devoid of ideas in that crucial period of time that, as Max has just said, may have been when we really squandered the opportunity politically? Um, this may be unfair, and it involves my institution and my class and my background, uh, Harvard. But George Bundy, I, I mean, David Halberstam got something, I think, very correct in his book, The Best and the Brightest. And may I also submit, ladies and gentlemen, that that's what happened in our presidential election of 2016. The best and the brightest were rejected by the deplorables. And Halberstam was on to something. Uh, Mac McNamara was, was cold, focused on numbers. He was more an MIT numbers guy, right? McGeorge Bundy was, was old line, New England, Harvard. I think he was dean of the faculty. He didn't have a PhD, if I recall. I you're right. Uh, but, I mean, McGeorge Bundy had everything figured out. Um, there's a story, a story. Um, I think it's in Halberstam, but I've, I've heard it from others, too. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, right after the inauguration, he's at the first cabinet meeting of the Kennedy cabinet, and he goes back up to the hill, and he goes with his mentor, Sam Rayburn. And he says something like, I'm sorry for the language, he's something like, Sam, I'm fucked. I mean, look at these people. I mean, MIT, PhD, Harvard this, Harvard. And he goes all these credentials of all the people in Kennedy's cabinet, whom I think to those of us who were around at the time, we were saying, my god, these are demigods. What was the, what was the other story about how a meeting of the, the, the Max, the, uh, the most brilliant meeting in the White House was the Kennedy cabinet since Thomas Jefferson dined alone? Um, so anyway, so Johnson is, is crying to, to Sam Rayburn about this. He's a class. He's this crude, vulgar Texan. And Sam Rayburn says something like, shit, Lyndon. I just wish one of those people had ever been elected sheriff. <laughs> and and the, McGeorge Bundy, um, there's something in there. You don't sympathize with other people. You rationalize everything. You impose conceptual boxes on other cultures, on other people. And you have, and this is what I think you see in retrospect if you read the memo to these people, you have this remarkable ability to rationalize. In other words, you know what outcome you kind of want the president to, do, to get to, right? So you rationalize the data, the this, the that, and, and if I read the memo, I come down and I say, right, option number one is, is the, that's the, you know, so there, there is a, a, a danger in being too smart. So last question for I you, Stephen. Just, can I just jump in oh, yeah, with one, Absolutely. one fast anecdote that supports the point that Steve is making about the arrogance of the best and brightest? 
This was something, a meeting that occurred in 62 when Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara called Ed Lansdale, who at that point was essentially what we would now call the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations, called him into his office and said he had this graph paper there and he had a pencil and he said, you know, Ed, I'm working on uh, on arithmetizing the, 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 the Vietnam War, getting everything into, into the computer here, and I have a list of factors, and I want you to help me with, with getting the numbers right. And, you know, Lansdale stood there and listened to him for a little bit and said, well, Mr. Secretary, you know, I'm happy to be helpful, but you, you need to remember the most important factor of all, which is the X factor. And McNamara immediately writes X factor on his graph paper, <laughs> and, you know, he says, okay, great, tell me how to calculate that. And Lansdale says, well, unfortunately, Mr. Secretary, I don't know how to calculate it because the X factor is the most important thing of all, but you can't get it down to numbers. It's the feelings of the people, who the people actually want to be governed by. And that is going to resist any attempt to reduce the war down to an arithmetic calculation. And so, of course, McNamara, being McNamara, instead of listening to Lansdale and taking this in, concluded that Lansdale was an idiot who was too stupid to understand this new technology and basically shunted him off from having any more influence on, on the course of Vietnam policy. If we had done it right, how long would it have taken? Three years. Well, we, well, did, we, it. Did, it. we did it in three years with cords. You know, well, that's, that's a little bit flip because one of the things I, I, a couple of other things I put in the book, there, there are two other things. I, I have a chapter on, on Bunker as the ambassador and I call it something like setting the context. You gotta set the context. And that, and that is your, goes to your point, Michael, the capacity, the ability of your ally. If you don't set the context, if you don't have the right leadership, the right, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things, the economy, then your Accords effort ain't gonna work. So I'm being flipped. But if you set the context, three years. Going back to another point is in 64, this goes to, uh, there was a, there was a Vietnamese government in 64, which, which um, and these are my, were my friends, right? Um, so, which um, Robert McNamara, Cabot Lodge, Harkins, I mean, Westy, they had no clue. This was a government of, of, of Divex who put, who had a coalition approach to fighting the communists, coalition from villages on up. That same party, that same philosophy shows up again under Thieu after the Tet Offensive, and is the Vietnamese partner to Colby and the Cords Organization. It was there in 64, and we pushed it aside. But if we did it, we did it for three years. You say we succeeded in 72 in helping the South Vietnamese repel one particular invasion. So what did we get wrong? I mean, obviously, it would have been better to start sooner. But, but what did we get wrong that meant that ultimately the war was lost if we did what you said for the length of time you espoused, got to an okay place in 72? Was it just too abrupt of a departure or what? No, there was something else. And it's something I'm, I came across um, when I was working with Ellsworth. And I don't want to talk about it too much because uh, I'm trying to write a book about it. But from my point of view, um, the Vietnam War was lost on May 31, 1971, in Paris. And if you want more background, please contact Henry Kissinger. For those well, of you, I mean, there's, there's a big, that's, big that's, story there. That's a, that's a cryptic reference, basically, to the fact that, you know, we that the Paris Peace Accords negotiated by Henry Kissinger and, and obviously under Nixon were ultimately lopsided in that we removed all of our troops from South Vietnam, but uh, North Vietnam was allowed to keep more than 200,000 of its own troops in South Vietnam, and that was ultimately the lopsided bargain that doomed the state of South Vietnam. But I think, you know, going back to what Steve was saying, the success in, in, in stopping, repelling the Easter Offensive in 1972, and we had only about 5,000 advisors in in, in South Vietnam, but they were able to call on massive air power. I think if we had kept that kind of commitment indefinitely up to the present day, you know, it's possible that, or even likely, that South Vietnam would have survived. Now, if, if I could follow up on that, for this is very important, and none of this is covered, I think, in the Ken Burns documentary, which is sort of going to be the, the collective wisdom of our people about this. So first of all, Henry shows up in Saigon with the peace agreement in, in September uh, 72. He presents it to Thieu in an English version, right? Not any of that Vietnamese draft. And Thieu suddenly realizes, and this is a much longer story here too, but Thieu suddenly realizes that his fundamental condition, that the North Vietnamese regular army, the Pavin, leaves South Vietnam, has been ignored. The Pavin are going to stay in South Vietnam, and he refuses to sign. 
It's coming up on the 68 election, right? And he's got, you know, he's got his American patron. And he refuses to sign. The consequence was Bunker has to negotiate private letters from Nixon to Tew promising B-52s if the Pavan ever goes on the offensive inside South Vietnam. In the United States, we had a little affair called Watergate. President Nixon resigns. If you, if you read Van Tien Yum's book, Dai Tang Mu Swan, Great Spring Victory, it says, Lei Zuan, after the resignation, right, Lei Zuan calls together the Politburo and says, let's test them. So they, they, they use the Pavan troops to go after a remote, godforsaken provincial capital, Fuklam, right? And they surround Fuglom and they take Fuglom. Gerald Ford is president. The B-52s are not set. Oh, by the way, oh yeah, the, the Politburo is meeting 24-7 in Hanoi with a landline going down to their commander at Fuglom. The commander reports back to the Politburo, we have taken it, no B-52s, we got the province. And Lei Zuan said, that's it, the Americans are not coming back, release the troops. So this just goes to Max's point, that if we had remained a credible ally in 75, not clear that Hanoi could have conquered the South. Well, thank you. I I've monopolized enough. I think a lot of you are going to want to get in on this. And so please just wait for a microphone, identify yourself. And if you want to direct the question to one or the other, that that's great. Please, right here. You get in the fourth row. Yeah, Eric Hershorn. Uh, I feel as though I'm listening to a discussion of how the deck chairs should have been arranged on the Titanic, and my question is whether this was ever a good place to take a stand or whether it was quicksand from the get-go. If I, if I could speak to that historically with a little personal thing, um, but another factor, again, strategic. I don't know how many of you um, know or remember Norm Hanna. Norm Hanna wrote a book, I can't remember of it. Norm Hanna was, the, was Paul Mill for SYNCPAC in the, in the 50s and in the 60s. Anyway, Norm is a State Department, I think. Norm's argument was the place to take a stand was Laos, in the mountains of Laos, to prevent the North Vietnamese from infiltrating. And apparently the only piece of advice that President Eisenhower gave to incoming President Kennedy when the two men met before they went up to the inauguration was that. He says the most dangerous thing you have to face is Laos. Halberstam talks about this, I think some others. Uh, there was a compromise, that, oh, because of the Bay of Pigs, and the, and the military, our military refused to go into Laos because there are no logistic bases, there's no support, how can you use it? So Kennedy has to compromise in Laos. He then concludes that for whatever reason, the line you have to defend is South Vietnam, which has a long border. That's one factor. The second factor, um, could, could, was there anything there? Was there any there there in two grounds? One, and these are the two arguments I think I remember as a college kid, fueling the anti-war movement. One was, these people don't deserve our help. There's nothing there, there's no there there. A bunch of crooks, they're a bunch of this, they're a bunch of that, they're fracks, you know, they're, who knows what. They're not, they, they don't get their act together. The second thing was, they can't perform. They're, they're impractical, unworthy allies, because they cannot deliver one of those two things. The, the original premise of the American commitment to South Vietnam which was the October 23rd letter of Eisenhower to Ziem, which, and this is the, the reveal, uh, was written by my father, uh, who was head of Southeast Asian Affairs for the State Department at the time. And it very expressly references, and this point has been overlooked by everybody, it expressly references nationalism among the Vietnamese as a motivating force. Um, and I remember Dad, um, he was a new frontiersman, an ambassador to Thailand. I mean, uh, um, we were in Thailand, and everyone, I was a kid in high school, and I didn't get it, you know, but my dad's sense of going back to Washington, meeting with McNamara, uh, and coming back, and this, this, this was his team, Rusk, um, they never got this point about nationalism. That Ed, I mean, the Ed, my dad and Ed Lansdale worked very closely together. They never got the point that if you're going to have the Vietnamese become worthy and stand up and be effective, you've got to appeal to their nationalism. To this day, we do not have, in English, a book which will tell you about Vietnamese nationalism. 
I tried to put two chapters in my book. Um, and this is sort of, you know, I apologize for being pretentious, but I bring these along. Um, this is the political theory of Yang Tap Shintong. It is the Dai Viek theory. It was a theory written by Professor Wing Up Wei, who became a friend of mine. Um, and here is on the Vietnamese side the justification for the Cords program and village decentralization. It's in Vietnamese. Vietnamese nationalism goes back centuries. So let me put the same we, we, question. We never, we never studied it. I'll put the same question out to Max. And frankly, when you combine the odds of success, even for a better designed approach, with the relative strategic importance of Vietnam, was this war worth fighting? Well, I think the, the, the question is, was you know, South Vietnam worth supporting? And I think you can, you can certainly see why in the 1950s we decided to support South Vietnam as an anti-communist bulwark for the same reason that we supported South Korea, which was just as much of an artificial state and was uh, in many ways even more illiberal in the 1950s than, than South Vietnam was. But, you know, Ed Lansdale's philosophy was that, you know, South Vietnam had to basically stand or fall based on its own efforts, that we should not be fighting the war for them, that they needed to fight the war for themselves, and we needed to give them assistance, we needed to help them build up a viable political entity, but we should not be sending American troops to do the fighting. And I think that's a philosophy that, in hindsight, looks pretty good, because whether we had, whether we would have won or lost the South Vietnamese War, it wouldn't have resulted in, even if we had lost, it wouldn't have resulted in the deaths of 58,000 Americans and you know, millions of, of Vietnamese in this firepower intensive struggle. Uh, we got the worst of all worlds, that we, we disregarded the Lansdale, Ken Young approach, Steve's father, uh, to try to build up a viable political entity in South Vietnam. And we thought we could just short circuit that process through massive use of firepower. And you know, I get, I get, I got some chills just yesterday when I saw a story in the New York Times about how we are using B-52s to fight the Taliban in Afghanistan. We have tried using B-52s to fight guerrillas before. It has not worked well. It will not work well in the future. Okay, we'll take two in this round. We'll start with Gary, and then we'll go to the third row here. We'll take them both together before we go to you guys. Uh, thanks very much for this conversation. I'm Garrett Mitchell. Um, I write the Mitchell Report, and I, I want to, uh, I, I think this, speaks, uh, I'm going I'm to direct this uh, to Max, but um, not, not because I'm not interested in, in, the, in the point of view of everybody up there. And that is, um, you know, it seems to me the two, the two questions that people wrestle with are, should we have ever been there, and could we have won? And the question that I'm, as I sit and listen to this conversation this afternoon, the question that I get more and more intrigued with was, what difference leaving aside the death of people who, who I'm, I'm leaving aside that part of it, but in political terms, what difference would it have made to us and to the Vietnamese if we had won that war? What, what would the world, how, how would the world have been different if America had won the Vietnam War is really the question that I'm intrigued about. Great. And we'll take one more before we go to the response. Um, Eleanor Bachrock. Um, I have micro and macro side of the question, the micro being, uh, Mr. Boat, you say that uh, uh, we should have supported GM more, but at the same time, you point to how he was uh, asserting more and, you know, things were already falling apart under him, partly, maybe largely because of his brother and his dragon lady wife, but uh, I'm not convinced, and of course they couldn't have foreseen. But the larger question is, was the original sin our intervening to prevent the elections in the mid-1950s over uh, reuniting the uh, uh, Vietnam because it was anti-democratic. And it seems to me that when I was studying Southeast Asia in college, uh, uh, there was a lot about it being a nationalist movement more than communist. So we'll start with Max Boot, and then if Steve wants to come. Okay, there are a lot of questions out there. You're referring to the reunification elections that were agreed to in the 1954 Geneva Accords. But remember, the United States was, and South Vietnam were not actually parties to the Geneva Accords. Uh, and so we were not bound to... 
uh, to implement them. And the notion that there could have been free and fair elections across Vietnam is just is just an illusion because by by 1956, North Vietnam was a uh, communist dictatorship. Ho Chi Minh was not going to allow a free and fair vote, and we didn't want a free and fair vote either because North Vietnam was bigger than within South Vietnam, and some and Ho Chi Minh also had greater standing as a nationalist leader, having defeated the French, than the guy we were supporting, No Dinh Diem. So, yeah, un un undoubtedly, you know, we would have lost, and the and the peninsula, and, and you know, R Vietnam would have been reunified under under Ho Chi Minh. But that was some, that was why. President Eisenhower didn't want to have that election. So that's, you know, but I don't think that it was therefore necessarily illegitimate to back the state of South Vietnam any more than it was legit illegitimate to back the state of South Korea, which remember under Sing Bin Rhee during the v Korean War was not a democracy. Uh, and actually Ed Lansdale was working on trying to develop more of a democratic polity in, uh, in, in, in South Vietnam. And the point on ZM was that, yes, he was, there was a crisis going on in 1963, but you know, the, the view of a lot of smart people, including Lansdale and Rostow and others, was that, you know, we should not necessarily get rid of ZM because that would make the situation worse. What we needed to do was to guide ZM along a, a more consensual approach uh, and less confrontational because, you know, his brother, No Din Nu, was pushing the confrontational approach, but we didn't have anybody on the American side who had his confidence to try to move him along in a more conciliatory fashion, which is why Lansdale kept trying to get out to Vietnam, and he kept being stymied by his bureaucratic enemies. I mean, one of the, one of the turning points I mentioned in the book happened in 1961 when Lansdale became very close to JFK, and JFK listened to him on counterinsurgency. He introduced him to the problem of Vietnam, and he, he talked about making Lansdale the ambassador to, to Vietnam, or possibly making Steve's father, Ken Young, the ambassador, and having Lansdale go out as his political advisor. And in hindsight, a lot of people, including Ross Dow and a lot of others, think that history might have taken a different turn if that had happened because they could have exercised a positive influence over ZM and avoided this terrible confrontation that we had in 1963. Now, your question, remind me again quickly. Uh, How much difference would it make yeah. if we had done a successful job? Oh, and, and what, if we had won the war, right, right, got it, got it, yes, if we had won. Well, I think it would, certainly would have made a big difference to, to millions of people who might uh, now be alive and quite leaving aside just, the, no, 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 let me finish. Leaving aside the victims of the American, uh, of the war on, on both sides, Vietnamese and Americans, what I'm thinking of specifically are all the people who died in 1975 after the fall of South Vietnam and then the fall of Cambodia, of course, because Cambodia probably would not have fallen to the communists if South Vietnam had not fallen. And of course, we know the killing fields in Cambodia, something like two million people killed. We know hundreds of thousands of boat people killed fleeing uh, Southeast Asia, just a, a humanitarian nightmare. And beyond that, I think, you know, obviously the loss of the Vietnam War affected American confidence. Uh, it led to major strategic setbacks elsewhere around the world. It was, you know, as, as we all remember, those of us who, you know, who were old enough, uh, and I barely was old enough at the time, but, you know, the crisis of confidence that the country suffered. And also, I think, but remember also what it meant for, for Vietnam, because, you know, eventually, in more recent years, Vietnam has followed the kind of reformist, market-Leninist path of China. And so it's becoming a more prosperous and bustling place. But, you know, anybody who visits Vietnam today sees very quickly that so southern Vietnam, uh, you know, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, remains a much more vibrant and economically bustling place than Hanoi is. Uh, and so it's not hard to see what might have been because remember like in the case of Korea, in, in 1960, North Korea was richer than South Korea. North Korea was more uh, developed. It had all the industry. Today, of course, South Korea is like the 11th richest country in the world and North Korea is one of the poorest. And again, Vietnam is a very poor place but I, I would submit to you that if South Vietnam had gone a different way, if it had gone the way of South Korea or Taiwan and had remained non-communist and an American ally, it could today be another Asian tiger uh, like, like, like Taiwan, like South Korea. And if, eventually it's getting there anyway, okay? You can say it's getting there anyway, it's becoming an ally of America anyway, and that's true. But I think we've, we've basically lost a few decades of development along the way. Steve, you want to comment on any of that? Uh, on your question first, uh, two things come to mind. One. The consequence for we Americans, this gets more complicated because we got into it, but if we had won, we would not be such a divided society today. We would not have had the sense of whatever we want to call it, and from wherever you all are on the political spectrum, but that sense of American exceptionalism, that sense of American idealism, the sense of patriotism, the sense of being proud, that would be very strong, and we would have a center to our politics. The rot and corruption 
which is facing us today, started with a sense of something has gone wrong. Our government lied to us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think we can all relive those years. Secondly, and this is yet to happen, but I predict from, um, that the Chinese are going to buy Vietnam. All right, just cash. They've already bought half the Politburo, I'm told, by cash. They have stolen the islands that they're, they're militarizing in the, in the South China Sea are Vietnamese. They stole them from the Vietnamese. If China militarizes the South China Sea, you could argue. Have you all thought about the ship traffic that goes through the South China Sea every day? If, if you want to destroy Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea, and Southeast Asia, what do you do? You close the South China Sea, which the Chinese can do right now today, because they've got the anti-ship missiles and they've got the land-based bases. They just shoot the ships. Now, that provokes World War III, but what the heck? I mean, they can win it, right? I'm being, I'm being flipped, but that's a real consequence. If they dominate Vietnam, they get to South China Sea. If Vietnam were split and the southern part of Vietnam was strong economically, militarily, in a democratic society, China would have a much more difficult time. I don't think they could get to South China Sea. So that's one. Going back to, uh, to your points, um, the original sin. Another point that I think is out there, you can find it. Um, Khrushchev would not pressure Ho Chi Minh to have a fair election in 1956 because Khrushchev didn't want the elections because of the precedent for the Koreas and the Germanys. The Russians did not want any talk of, a, of, a, of elections to unify Germany or unify Korea. So he had to stop it in South Vietnam. That's sort of another fact on this. Secondly, you mentioned this great gorilla in the room, which is, which is sort of Ho and the Viet Minh as nationalists. Uh, a very, very common uh, feeling. I think it's a myth because um, you have to look at the murders in 1945 and 1946 because Ho and the Viet Minh murdered the leading nationalists, like, like the guy who came up with, with this, you know, Drung Tu An is a young man. He's put together the Diviek Party in 1939. He's hauled off and murdered in 1946. Right? Win Fu Shou, who at age 19 in 1939, has a transcendental experience. He sets up the Waha <coughs> religion. He's got hundreds of thousands of followers. He's murdered in 1947, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ho Chi Minh and his people brought the French back to Central and North Vietnam in March of 1947, uh, 19, 1946. They brought them back. And then you had, for about six months, the communists and the French cooperating in, in el el eliminating nationalist leadership. When the nationalist leadership has been eliminated by the fall, guess what? These two parties turn against each other. Right? Ho and his people go to the Vietnamese people and say, oh my god, those nasty French want to come back and reestablish colonialism. Join us and we'll fight the French. The French then say, oh my god. These, these Ho Chi Minh, he's not really a nationalist. We've just discovered he's a communist. Catholics and wealthy people of Vietnam, rally to the tricolor. We will protect you. And, you know, this is where the Graham Greene image of the third force comes up, right? Most Vietnamese sort of say, now what do we do? We have no leaders. We've got the communists on one side, the colonialists on the other. What are we going to do? In 1954, two people arrived to try to deal with the third force. Right? One is Ed Lansdale, the American, who's got this down. I mean, just read, read, read The Quiet American. Graham Greene is, is, is um, almost apoplectic in putting down these Americans for trying to work with the nationalists. And then the other guy is Ngo Dinh Tiem. So this story about nationalism has never really been covered. And there's not more than one word, I think, about the genuine Vietnamese nationalist in the Ken Burns series. Okay, so let's go to another round. I think this time I'm going to take four in the hope that there'll be sort of two for each of our guys up here. So uh, we'll, we'll go with um, Sandy, and then we'll, we'll go one, two, three, four. So row one, two, three, and four, and then we'll have time for another round. Don't worry. Sandy Ap <coughs> Apgar, CSIS. Um, we appear to have a national security advisor and team today who reflect the best and brightest criteria of the Halberstam era and your own descriptions. Do they, in your view, uh, represent an understanding of the lessons we're here to discuss? Um, in what way do they, in what way don't they? Okay, and then here, please, blue shirt. 
Gordon Bear, Army and State Department, retired. It seems to me that American policy in uh, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan has followed essentially the same trajectory, engage, escalate, and abandon. Uh, it took us uh, three years uh, or so to learn how to do counterinsurgency, uh, which we did successfully uh, after 1968, and then threw it away uh, in Iraq. Uh, Petraeus rewrote the book on counterinsurgency. He had done his dissertation on Vietnam. He had some help from, uh, from other people, uh, mainly Army officers as opposed to State Department or academic types. We abandoned Iraq in 2011. The Obama administration wanted to abandon uh, Afghanistan in 2016, but fortunately turned that one around. Um, I'd appreciate your comment on that. And one final footnote, as uh, Mr. Boot pointed out, the uh, bloodbath in Southeast Asia uh, after 1975 was ignored or minimized in the Ken Burns documentary. And Father, right behind you. John Hurley was a Cords rep uh, in Cords Skag. That's another initial, S-C-A-G. This was the Saigon Civil Assistance Group. So my address was Cords Skag uh, under Hatcher James. But... Uh, whose counterpart would the mayor. But at the time I was there was after, after the Tet Offensive, and um, we were involved to a large extent in, you know, helping to rebuild areas that had been smashed up during the uh, Tet Offensive. I uh, was in an uh, outlying area beyond Shalon, District 7, and that was made up of, um, on the one hand, about half of them were Catholic refugees from the north, and the uh, principal <coughs> individuals with each comb, which each group was the local priest. And the other half were the Buddhist uh, contingent, and the principal individual there would have been a, a Buddhist monk. I certainly agree with your comment that they, they worked together because there was a sense of... Um, uh, concern uh, about the communists, about the Viet Cong, and they had experienced what, what could be done. Thank you. And we've got a final question in this round in the fourth row. Here, here in the fourth row, and then we'll, no, then we'll start in the sixth row next, with the next round. Uh, Lionel Rosenblatt, I'm a Cords graduate as well. Uh, working with um, South Vietnamese in the field, uh, the corrosiveness of, of the corruption really was one of our chief obstacles. The local leadership, military and civilian, were quite aware that their superiors had bought their positions and that, indeed, the American presence had fueled the price of a province chief's job or the price of a corps commander's job. So we had good people to work with at the relatively junior levels, but no way for them to succeed unless we targeted corruption as a problem and used our leverage to deal with it. We didn't use that leverage, and I think we need to recognize that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think that, can I just jump in? Uh, please, go ahead. I, I was going to actually oh, make sure that you, well, you do the questions on the 21st century, because those were the first two. And I was going to start with Steve to, to handle the last question, just trying to make sure we get through, but you can still comment on it when the floor is yours. How about that? I just want to keep sure. the pace going, because I have time for a couple more rounds here. So, Steve, that last question to you, oh, please. First of all, if I may, ladies and gentlemen, I would like Lionel Rosenblatt and Parker Borg to stand up. Parker? Please. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to you two American heroes because these two guys in March 1975 started a refugee movement when Henry Kissinger and Gerald Ford didn't want to do it. And because of them, 170, 150,000 South Vietnamese allies of ours were saved. And you guys need to be applauded. Uh, on corruption, uh, Lionel is, uh, as usual, uh, prescient, uh, insightful, and very hard-minded. Um, a major problem which I don't think the South Vietnamese elite ever really dealt with, uh, not for the lack of trying by a lot of Americans, and not for a lack of trying by uh, a number of uh, Vietnamese. Um, I think the... I've been thinking about this for years. Um, uh, 
there's a cultural dynamic, and it's part of, I mean, we see this throughout transitioning societies, partially, mm -hmm. which is patron-client politics. I mean, Afghanistan, all these issues you guys experienced in there, right? Iraq, corruption in Iraq, corruption in Afghanistan. Um, if I'm going to get ahead, I need Lionel and I need Parker as part of my team. I've got to take care of them. And I have to take care of them in material ways. Money, foreign bank accounts, houses, stuff for the wife, whatever it is. I've got to have a source of funds. Uh, but I'm not alone. All of you, if we're all in this system, you're all parts of patron-client relationships. And patron-client relationships are nourished by, by wealth. Um, Boss Tweed in New York, Daly in Chicago. I mean, it, it, it's a... And, and this is a political structure, and Max, I'd be appreciate your thinking on this. This is a political structure that is very advantageous to idealistic, motivated insurgents, right? Whether they're the Taliban or, or, the, or, or, or ISIS in Iraq or, or certain aspects of the communists in Vietnam. And to me, this is, this is the Achilles heel of the strategy that I recommend of associative power. If our basic approach is associated to power with a group of people in another country, and they're running traditional patron-client systems, and we go in there and we lecture them on, on you know, um, honesty, integrity, live on your salary. I mean, I remember um, a lieutenant in, in Tambin province, was, you know, a lieutenant was getting <coughs> whatever it was, 2,000 piastres a month, the RD lieutenant. He's got a wife, he's got two kids. I think one bag of rice was, was 500 piastres. His monthly salary buys him four bags of rice. I mean, the, the guy can't make it, right? So the wife is out working. But I mean, I think you, you've, you've hit on a structural problem that I don't think we, as a foreign policy elite, have really looked at with any great sophistication. So let's go to Max for that, and then the other questions on 21st century applications and issues. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree that, that corruption is kind of the sleeper issue that we don't pay enough attention to. And it was striking to me the parallels between the challenges we face today and what the challenges that Lansdale was involved in from 65 to 68, because he was, uh, when, as, as an advisor to the U.S. ambassadors, he kept beating the drums about corruption, that we had to reduce the mass of corruption, which again, as, as the questioner suggested, was being fueled by our own cash, exactly the same as it's happened in Iraq and Afghanistan in recent years. And, you know, he wanted to push reformers uh, within the Arvin military structure. He wanted to, you know, take away the ability of the, of the, of the military junta to appoint the, the provincial and district chiefs because he, he didn't want them to use those as patronage posts where people just bought their jobs and then recovered the cost through, through corruption. And he just had no support in the Johnson administration because, again, nobody really cared about that kind of stuff. All they wanted to do was go out and kill VC. And, you know, they... And this, and the same, same exact problem we've had in Af Afghanistan and Iraq, because if you're cracking down on corruption, you have to have some very difficult conversations and confront your own military allies who are in the middle of that corruption. And it's much easier just to avoid that altogether and just turn a blind eye. I mean, it's ironic because uh, you, you'd asked about the current national security leadership. I mean, I was actually, it's funny because I was part of a small advisory team for General Petraeus in Afghanistan when he came in as the commander in 2010. And what our assessment was, was that corruption was the number one issue driving the Taliban. And so we had to do something to address it. And what General Petraeus did was actually he appointed something called Task Force Shafafia to address corruption led by this, this promising young army general named H.R. McMaster. But of course, he only had limited success because it's a very difficult, intractable problem. And much of the rest of the U.S. government just wants to keep relationships as they are and not to, not to cause confrontation and upheaval with our allies. I mean, in terms of the question was in terms of what is what lessons are, have they learned today? I mean, very interesting question because, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, HR uh, gained prominence uh, for his best-selling uh, PhD dissertation called Dereliction of Duty, in which he very harshly blasted the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in, in the 60s for not being more confrontational with President Johnson. Um, you know, I have mixed feelings about that thesis because I'm not sure the Joint Chiefs of Staff knew what they were doing either because they were actually in favor of a more conventional uh, brute force military approach. I don't know that would have been successful either, but I mean, it's certainly, as many people have remarked, it'll be interesting to see what, what HR's views are on the proper role of military officers in government now that he is himself at the center of, of power in, in this administration. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, to, to the other point that was made about how we were repeating in Iraq and Afghanistan some of the same mistakes, and I think there is, there is an element of truth to that. It's not only our short attention span and our tendency to think we're just going to whip the bad guys and leave, uh, but also our inattention to issues of corruption, as we were discussing, and political governance, and, and we don't see those as being really the center of gravity for the conflict, which they really are at the end of the day. It's not, we're not going to win just by killing insurgents, but there's a tendency to, even now, although we don't necessarily use the same brute force methods as in Afghanistan, as in, as in Vietnam, uh, you know, we don't have free fire zones, we don't have nightly harassment and interdiction fire where we're just randomly firing artillery, uh, but we're much more precise today, but there's a tendency today to think that with our drone strikes and our precision guided munitions that we can just kill individuals and in, in, by basically by leadership targeting to, uh, to defeat the insurgency. And that has not worked because you've seen what happened since 2001. I mean, we've killed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Islamist uh, 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 warriors all over the world. And there are probably more Islamist terrorists today than there were in 2001. Those groups remain stronger, even though some have been defeated, others have arisen. And so I think the lesson we need to learn from Vietnam is it's all about governance. And until you get the governance right, you're not going to win lasting victories, whether it's in you know, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, name a country. And of course, very, very hard to get governance right. And that's why we tend to, to, to avoid it. And, you know, Nation building is a is a third rail in Washington. One of the few things that that Trump and Obama agree on is that they both hate nation building. But at the end of the day, you're not going to win unless you do nation building. That's how we won the war in in Germany, Japan, and South Korea. We did it through nation building. And if we avoid doing nation building today, we're not going to win. So we, uh, let's, go go to, let's go to one last round because we only have five minutes to go, and, and you can get whatever final okay. comment you've got in. And that uh, so let, let's see, I've got a. Uh, this woman here in the purple, and then we'll work our way over. Maybe uh, we'll even get the, Tim, I'm going to um, plead for your, uh, we'll discuss later, get these two guys who had their hands up for a while. So we'll go one, two, three, four, and then wrap up. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I graduated from college in 1969, so this was my war. I was married to an anti-war activist who was Harvard 67, uh, Marty Slate. Uh, you haven't talked about the anti-war movement. And a lot of the feeling in the anti-war movement was that people hated us um, because of the corruption, uh, that we, we, we lost the hearts and minds. Um, if, we, if there had not been an anti-war movement, would we still be there today, um, afraid that as soon as we left, the government would collapse? Thank you. And then here, the gentleman in the blue tie. And then we'll come over there. Dan Roper from the Association of the United States Army. I'd like you both to elaborate a little bit, if you would, on the binary nature of the discussion, whether it was hard power and soft power, which have gone to, you call it associative power, or smart power that is now what Nye is calling it, to the pr problems we've had in Iraq and Afghanistan with the big debates on, is it enemy-centric counterinsurgency or is it population-centric counterinsurgency? And is there, if we got too binary in the national security decision-making process where it's Again, it's not an either or when you're talking about a wicked, complex problem like either Iraq, Afghanistan, or Vietnam. And last two over here on this side. Yes, these two gentlemen. Uh, Stanley Rappaport, simple questions. Don't, with regard to governance, don't you think we should recognize Eisenhower as not getting us into the war because he realized that the war in Vietnam and, and supporting Yen Ben Phu was not going to work? And I'd like to ask about Kennedy. Do you think the issue of governance and the role of the Catholic Church with DM uh, uh, played a role in his choice to get into the war? And then finally, right behind you. And then we'll wrap up. Uh, Mike Golash. Uh, my question has to do with one of my being involved in the anti-war movement in the period. There seems there was a lot of belief that the American army, the soldiers, did not want to fight that war. And one of the reasons for our, the agreement to withdraw American troops uh, in our end of participation in the war was the lack of morale in the American army to continue the struggle. So, Steve, you want to take a couple of those questions and then leave yeah, it? Me, and any, any final thoughts and then same yeah, for Matt. Let me just try to, to, to shoot sort of bullet uh, responses. On your question about the National Security Council, so I have a friend and I'm trying to promote the book and the theory and everything like this on, on the supposition that it might be helpful. So I, got, I had breakfast uh, 
on my last trip to Washington and, and said, Steve, it's really interesting. I'll try to set up a meeting for you, but don't talk about Vietnam. So my, I, I, I was really, I was kind of crushed. I mean, how do you explain something to this staff if you don't, if you don't go into history, you know, if you don't learn from history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Anti-war movement, um, long, complicated thing. My sense is if you, if, if, you, if you go to Vietnam today and you have a private conversation with almost any Vietnamese, oh, including communists, right? USA, number one. Where do they want to send their kids? Where are they sending their money? I mean, our reputation among the Vietnamese, because we went there and we sacrificed and we did not ask for one ounce of gold, we did not ask for one acre of land, and frankly, they don't understand us. I mean, back then and now, they just think, you Americans. I mean, everybody else in history, you go there, you grab stuff, you know? But you people came, you lost 58,000 of your people, you tried to help us, you screwed up, but damn it, you're nice people. Uh, naive, maybe, naive, maybe. The other thing about the anti-war movement in terms of soft power, which I like to, to uh, is to why did Hanoi win? Hanoi had soft power in the United States, and we had zero soft power in Hanoi. The soft power of Hanoi in the United States was the anti-war movement. And that, I mean, a long conversation on that, but okay. Um, the, the link between um, declining morale in U.S. forces and withdrawal, my sense at the time was it was reversed. The real morale problem started after Nixon announced Vietnamization, which was taken by the military as a rejection of the hard power strategy. It was not seen as a sophisticated policy that, that it was that Nixon saw. And therefore, my sense is you're a draftee, you're in Vietnam in, in 69, 70, or 71, and you want to be the last guy killed? Because withdrawal in the hard power context is failure. So, so I think it was the other way around. Um, the, hard, the hard power, soft power, too binary. I think my point is ab we are much too binary. And I even in the book, I criticize Petraeus and Coyne, frankly. Basically, I'm saying I think, and McChrystal's uh, uh, plan for Afghanistan, they get 80% population centric, but they don't get the heart. They don't get the genius of Bill Colby, which is the people do it for themselves. The real trick is the people are the frontline troops. Everybody else is reserve. Your main forces, your drones, your this, your school buildings, your, your, your governance. Because if the people don't stand up and quote unquote fight, and often the fight in a critical situation, and my sense from afar is this is very true in Muslim societies, it's the mothers. It's the mothers who go to their sons and say, don't you join the Taliban. How do you motivate the mothers? And this and that. I mean, this, this is all people's, I would say not population-centric, Max. I think we ought to say people-centric. And get out with the people. Because if you do that, then things sort of solve themselves. And I really love your expression, uh, wicked problems. That's a technical term I picked up from academics in the Humphrey School. Uh, a wicked problem is, is what we had in Vietnam. It's Iraq, Afghanistan, it's Syria. No easy answers. And, and it takes a, a certain suppleness and sophistication of mind to see the different pieces you have to put together. That's another thing, by the way, we haven't had time to talk about. But with chords and these other things, you've got to have five or six things mutually interrelated happening all simultaneously. One of the other things I see in retrospect is we Americans tend to think in linear terms, particularly our military. Step one, and then step two, and then step three, and then step four. So you're, you're debating about step number one, and somebody says, yeah, you can't do number one because number four isn't in place. And then somebody else says, yeah, but you can't do number four until you get number one. And you debate, and you all end up going to number one, which is usually going out and try to kill somebody. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Max, and thank you very much for those eloquent comments. Max, the, to wrap up the whole day, uh, over to you. Well, let me just pick up on, on one question about President Eisenhower, and, and did he, you know, was he determined to keep us out of the war? I mean, there is some truth to that. In the spring of 1954, as Dien Bien Phu was on the verge of falling, there were a lot of uh, generals in the Pentagon, and certainly at, at the urging of, of the French, were trying to develop military options for us to save Dien Bien Phu. And Eisenhower was actually somewhat open to it, but he wanted the Allies to come on board. The British didn't, and he, congressional support was not there. And so at the end of the day, Eisenhower decided, no, we were not going to save the French bacon, in part because 
as Lansdale and others were arguing, uh, France could never succeed because they were essentially fighting for a colonialist regime and the, and the Vietnamese wanted uh, independence. But, you know, after uh, the fall of Dien Bien Phu and the ne negotiations at, in, in Geneva, which split the country in half, again, Eisenhower was not going to send large numbers of American troops to defend South Vietnam. What he did was he essentially sent Ed Lansdale and, and basically a dozen aides uh, through Alan Dulles and uh, the secretary, the, the CIA director and his brother, uh, John Foster Dulles, the secretary of, of state. And basically, Lansdale did what he had done in, in the Philippines, where in a similar situation in 1950, he had been uh, dispatched with a handful of aides to try to rescue a country that was in danger of falling to, to communist insurgents. And in both cases, he built up a local leader, Mag Sai Sai in the Philippines, CM in in South Vietnam. He instituted what we today call population-centric counterinsurgency, telling the army to stop abusing the people and to become brothers with the people. And by the way, the, the way that you know, population-centric counterinsurgency really works is that it isolates the guerrillas, and then you can target the guerrillas very accurately because the people rat them out. But you first have to win the confidence of the people to tell you who are the insurgents in their midst. And that's something that Lansdale pioneered in in both the Philippines and Vietnam. And he had the full support of President Eisenhower and the Dulles brothers because, you know, Eisenhower did not want massive American military commitments. He favored covert action. He favored low-level types of interventions. And that was actually fairly successful. Not everywhere, but in general it was. And I would submit to you that today, as we think about a model for American policy going forward, that's not a bad model to think about because it avoids kind of the disasters of sending hundreds of thousands of troops into a war that nobody wants in a place like Iraq. But at the same time, we don't simply, we can't simply write off all these countries either because we know they're beating terrorism, they're creating threats that we need to be worried about. We can't have another Islamic state on the ground in a place like Iraq and Syria. And, you know, we are to some extent doing this, and we've done it successfully in recent years in places like El Salvador and Colombia and elsewhere, where we've used essentially relatively small-scale advisory missions with that in providing aid to the local governments and building up local leaders like uh, President Uribe in, in, in Colombia to defeat the insurgents and take the lead on their own with American help. That's kind of the Lansdale model. That's what Ed Lansdale was arguing for in Vietnam. You can argue about whether we ever had a chance to do that in Vietnam, but we certainly lost that chance after we, we, we uh, colluded in the overthrow of No Dinh Diem in November of 1963. But in the future, you know, I would say let's avoid that mistake and let's think about how we can apply that Lansdale model of low-level engagement to deal with all the, all the national security threats that we face all over the world. Fantastic. Well, listen, let me first thank all of you because there's a lot of expertise in this room and a lot of great service. And I know uh, we all welcomed your comments and questions. And please join me in thanking these two guys.